Good afternoon, children. This is Grandma Carla, and right now I'm stuck in a traffic jam. So I thought I'd read to you a little bit. And we're going to read some more of Abby Lost at Sea. And remember, we are on chapter 15, and Abby is taking lunch to the captain. When Mr. Job unlocked the door to the captain's cabin, Abby saw the captain standing with head bowed before the great picture windows. We've come with your lunch, sir, she said, hoping to rouse him from what appeared to be a sad mood. He moved toward them, his shiny brass buttons still reflecting the light that streamed through the stern of the ship, but his eyes were dull. The captain needs cheering up, Abby thought, and why shouldn't he? His own men have betrayed him for gold, just like Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Oh, the poor man. Cook sent up some fresh fruit, Captain, along with the stew and the bread. Mr. Job seemed uncomfortable at the sight of Captain Chandler's sad face. He headed toward the door. Thank you, Mr. Job. Will the ship be docking in Honolulu tonight? Mr. Job grimaced. No, sir. Jackal said the ship will sell all she's carrying in China. I suppose that includes the children and me. Mr. Job placed a hand on the doorknob, his eyes on the floor. He spoke in a bare whisper. I, sir. He's sticking to his plans. If you give me your word, sir, as a gentleman, I'll be leaving the door unlocked for a bit so ye and the girl can visit. Abby realized it was a gift, a way to try to soften the blow. He left the room and closed the door, but there was no sound of the lock clicking. He feels bad about this, Captain. You're right, Abby. Mr. Job has served me well for seven years. He paused, running his hand through his thick hair. I just can't believe it's come to this. The men should be horsewhipped or hung, he growled. Abby set the tray down at his dining table. Maybe you should eat something, Captain. He nodded briefly. Sit with me. Abby saluted with a smile and the captain laughed out loud. There, he said, you've broken my bad mood. He began to eat with enthusiasm. Captain, have you figured out a way to get us freed? He sighed and set down his bread. I've prayed all morning, child, but as yet, I can't see how we can overpower so many men, or even a few, to win our way to the guns. Worse than that, I'm not sure where the powder and the shot is being kept, even if we could get the guns. Abby sat facing the great window, tugging at her lower lip and thought, what if we don't need the guns? What if we just slip away without anyone seeing us? You mean jump overboard in the midst of the sea? No, Luke and I were set adrift in a skiff, but we made it to land. What if we lowered the skiff and sailed away from the ship? The captain's brown eyes bored into hers. You mean sneak away when no one is looking, he asked? Exactly. Why, we could do it tonight. The captain stroked his chin. He sp spoke more to himself than to her. We certainly have to do it tonight. We'll be passing Oahu around midnight, and after that, it's a long way back to land again. Then tonight it is, Abby jumped up and moved toward the window. Do these open, Captain? The Captain was deep in thought. What? These windows, do they open? Only one girl, the small one on the side, to let in a breeze. Why do you ask? Abby fumbled with the latch. We need a way to get topside tonight so you and Luke can lower the skiff. Suddenly the door opened and Abby stood still as a mouse, her hand frozen on the latch. What are you doing? Luke asked as he entered the cabin. Luke, you scared the skin off me. Abby went back to work on the latch. Captain, Luke asked, what's Abby up to? He came up behind her to inspect the window. The captain joined them. This blue-eyed beauty has come up with a plan, boy, a plan to set us free. Both the children stared at him as he deftly lifted the latch and the window swung open. The cool Hawaiian trade winds blew through, bringing the scent of the sea and freedom to Abby. Grinning, Abby poked Luke in the stomach. 
It's going to work, Luke. I just know it. Abigail, the captain said, if your hopefulness was a cold, I'd be sneezing. You, who knows? But with the help of the Almighty, it just might work. He tousled Abby's thick hair and hugged her close. Thank you, child, he murmured. Turning to Luke, he gave orders. The two of you get in here tonight as soon as you can. As far as I can tell, we should be passing the island around midnight. But if you can keep your ears open for any talk among the men, that would help. We need information. Luke saluted with mischief. Aye, aye, sir. We'll be your eyes and ears topside. You'll make a dandy sailor someday, Luke. But for now, you'd best be on your way. I don't want anyone to know we're in here planning. Back to the slave galley, Appy joked. As they headed toward the door, the captain pierced them with a serious look. A word of warning, stay away from Jackal. The smile died on Abby's lips. It was good advice, advice she'd like to heed. But how did one stay clear of a brute while captive on the beast's own floating kingdom? The day dragged on. The ship's bell and wheel were cleaned. The sextant and other brass instruments were polished. Potatoes were peeled for the evening dinner, and the deck was scrubbed again at dusk. Finally, Luke and Abby were sent to the captain's cabin with dry bread and a watery potato soup. The captain bowed his head to thank God in spite of the unappetizing meal. After supper, he ordered Abby to the bunk to rest. You'll need your strength tonight, so try to get some sleep. It seemed she had only laid her head down a minute when the door swung open and Spandler, Jackal's right-hand man, stood over her, reeking of rum and sweat. Wake up, girl. The captain wants ye and your friend back at work. His spittles flew at her when he spoke. She sat up and backed away in the bunk. You're to serve him in the galley tonight. He lowered, glowered at her in the dim lantern light and then stalked out. Luke jumped up from his spot on the window seat where he'd been talking with the captain. His fists were clenched at his sides. It's all right, Abby. I'll be with you. The captain gripped a chair, his knuckles white. As he stared out the window, she saw that he too was angry, but not at her. Abby peered out the window, but she wasn't looking at the stars in the twilight. She was watching the reflection in the glass of a young girl, her long curls tucked into a single braid with her usual stray strands of ringlets hanging about her face. Her blue dress, which had fit her perfectly at the start of her journey from California, hung loosely about her waist. I'm at my fighting weight, Abby thought, surprising herself when, with unexpected spunk. I have God on my side, and he's brought me through this far. She watched as the girl in the glass straightened. Her shoulders went back, and her chin went up. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, Abby said. Captain Chandler jumped at her words. As she gazed at his reflection in the glass, she could see that his look of anger had disappeared, and in its place was something akin to admiration. Luke, he said, facing them both, Abby's right. You two work hard and trust in God. Jackal surely won't keep you all night. So as soon as you get back, we'll make good our escape. Luke scowled. How can you and Abby trust in something unseen when you're dealing with that devil? The captain put a calloused hand on Luke's shoulder. When you're dealing with the devil, boy, God is all you can trust in. Abby retraced her steps to the bunk and retrieved her high button boots. Lacing them up, she glanced over at Luke. Let's go. Abby and Luke headed toward the galley, where Jackal expected them to serve his dinner. But as they neared it, they could hear singing, wild, drunken sounds. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, -ho, and a bottle of rum. Abby swallowed hard. She'd never heard men behave like this before, not until they passed through Lahaina. Her mind flooded with the image of Jackal flying out of the grog shop and fisting the sailor in the street. She could see his biceps bulging in the tight shirt, smell his sweat, and feel her own fear again as she recalled his words. That'll help you remember me in the morning. Then that thickening thud, sickening thud, 
as his boot hit the fallen man's stomach. Abby and Luke stopped close to the galley and heard Jackal's ruthless voice. I and we'll sell six of the men in China too. That way there'll be less men to share the plunder with. Luke drew in a quick breath, but Abby was not surprised Jackal was willing to cheat his own men, for he had no scruples, no morals. The devil was the father of lies, and Jackal was his son. I don't want to face him, father. I'm afraid. Do not be afraid. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go. Even in the galley, if you go to the depths of the sea, I am there. But with such evil men, especially as you face darkness, for it is as light to me. Abby lifted her head. She was afraid, but she also trusted God. She threw her braid over her shoulder and took a deep breath. As she stepped into the glow of the galley's lantern light, a peace filled her. The talking abruptly stopped. Jackal scrutinized her. His eyes like shiny black marbles rimmed in red. Two other men sat at the table with him, Spandler and the cook. They grinned at the kids, but not in a friendly way. Girl, Jackal bellowed, bring me dinner. Abby could see he was already deep in his cups, sloppy drunk. The whole galley smelled of rum and unwashed bodies. You boy, Spandler directed, come with me and Cookie to the bilge. We've got to haul supplies up. Abby caught Luke's glance of concern for her, but there was no use arguing, she knew. It was best to get the work done and get back to the captain. With God's help, they'd soon be gone. She nodded at Luke as he and the two men left for the lower deck. Abby obediently went to the counter where she ladled soup from a large pot into a bowl. Carefully, she set it before Jackal. He glared at her, now get some bread. When she returned with a large chunk, he gestured the, at the bench. Sit down. Abby did, but, Abby did, but wondered what he wanted. I don't like you, Jackal began, slurring slightly. Girls don't belong on board ship. Where'd you come from, anyway? Luke and I went overboard in a storm. We came ashore a few miles west of Lahaina. It took a moment for her story to register with him, but finally he threw back his head and cackled. Ye fell out of a ship only to get caught in the middle of a mutiny? I told ye, girls shouldn't sail. He laughed uproariously, food splashing out of his mouth. How'd you like the idea of going sightseeing in China? Abby wondered why he was asking her these questions. She did not trust him or his motives. God is with me, she blurted out. Jackal leapt from his seat spilling the soup, and reached across the table for her wrist. Don't talk to me about God, he spat out. Me mother believed in him, but she went to her grave early. There is no God. Abby winced as his meaty fist closed around her wrist and pinched her hard. She stared into his bloodshot eyes until he lowered his gaze. Mr. Jackal, I am sorry for your loss. I can't explain all the heartache that's happened. That happens, but I know God cares. Jackal flushed as he caught her eye. For a brief moment, Abby thought she'd made a connection with him, but then his eyes hardened and he flung her wrist back at her. You're dangerous. Just like the captain, tonight I'm making some changes. Soon as Spandler gets back, I'll have him move your dear captain to the bilge. He got up and moved around the table toward her then. In the meantime, you're going to spend your nights tied up here, and your little friend will be tied up topside. Abby's heart did a double jump. If Jackal gave those orders, they'd never get to a, a chance to escape. They'd be sold in China, and she'd never see Ma, Pa, or Sarah again. Jackal staggered over to the corner of the galley and retrieved a coil of rope hanging on the wall. As he neared her, Abby panicked. She had to do something. When he bent to wrap the rope around the center leg of the table, Abby didn't even think. She just reached for the giant pepper shaker and raised it above her head. Whack! 
The cracking sound was loud in her ears as the pepper shaker connected with Jackal's skull. The blow momentarily stunned him. He fell face down onto the tabletop amid a pile of black peppercorns, then careened onto the table bench. Abby's eyes almost bulged out of her head. She knew if he came to, she would be instant shark bait. I've got to get out of here. She fled toward the doorway, but stopped short with the terrifying thought. What if I've killed him? She gulped and turned slowly around. She just had to know if he was breathing. Fear made her heart pound furiously as she moved back toward the table. There was no sign of life. Only the back of his head and neck showed from where she should. She stood. She would have to get closer. Abby moved around the end of the table and stopped within two feet of him, but she still couldn't see. She bent down on one knee, staring intently at his chest. It was hidden beneath the table, but it was no good. There wasn't enough light to see whether or not he was breathing. She did not dare touch him to find out. Abby dragged a chair over to the lantern, then climbed up to lift it from the hook on the ceiling. Hurrying back to Jackal, she set the lantern under the table where the light could shine on his belly and chest. She kneeled down and peered up under the table. He's breathing. Relieved, Abby reached for the lantern, but just as she was about to flee, Abby noticed something sticking out of the front of Jackal's shirt. A bit of leather. The treasure map. Abby's pounding heart did a triple time beat. She could scarcely breathe. Should I take it? Her hand began to reach out, almost as of its own accord, and her knees inched over to within a foot of him. She touched the edge of the leather scroll, held her breath, and began to tug gently. It wouldn't budge. She'd have to move his arm to free it. As she inched closer, her hair brushed against Jackal's knees. She gingerly left his arm and slid the map out with shaking fingers. Just as she turned to scramble away, he groaned. She didn't wait to see if he would awaken. Abby raced for the doorway, tucked the treasure map down in her front button dress. She ran all the way to Captain Chandler's cabin and threw open the door. Gasping, gasping for breath, she slammed the door shut. Captain Chandler jumped up and came over, looking deep into her eyes. Luke joined them. Abby, are you all right? She could see concern on both of their faces. Yes, yes, I'm all right, but now's a good time to take leave of Jackal's company, if you get my meaning. Her flushed face and dilated eyes were all that the explanation that Captain Chandler needed. It's almost time by my reckoning anyway. Luke, let's get the window open and climb up. The two hurried to the window and unlatched it. From inside the window seat, Captain Chandler produced a coil of thick hemp rope. On one end, a loop was tied. Abby, you're to jump to us when we give the signal. Do you understand, girl? Yes. With or without a signal, she was more than ready to leave the trip. If Jackal woke up or if Spandler discovered that he wasn't actually asleep, Captain Chandler climbed out first and balanced cautiously on the windowsill. Luke tied one end of the rope to the latch on the window seat, while the captain took the other end with him. Gripping the top of the window with his left hand, he swung the rope in a circle the way Abby had seen caballeros throw lariats around cattle in California. But she couldn't see where the, rope, where the looped end of the rope had landed. He tried several times before it apparently hit its mark, on the deck above, for the captain gripped the rope with both hands and pulled himself up hand over hand. Luke followed. Alone in the cabin, Abby could feel her legs begin to tremble. She leaned out the window and inhaled the salty sea air. Take deep breaths, she told herself. It will be over soon. She sucked in the cool trade winds, but she couldn't shake the feeling of impending doom. And that is the end of chapter 15 of Abby Lost at Sea.